Lecture 38, The Diagnosis of Mental Illness. So far, aside from a discussion of the effects of brain damage, we focused this course on the mind and behavior characteristic of normal adults and children. Now it's time to examine mental illness in its own right. Abnormal and maladaptive behavior, the disordered mental structures and processes that underlie it, and the interventions that treat and prevent mental illness. This is the general domain of psychopathology, a term that's obviously derived from two Greek roots. Psycho, from the Greek psyche, soul, referring to the mind, and pathology, from the Greek pathos, suffering, referring to disease or illness. The term makes it clear that mental illness is in some sense analogous to physical illness. Just as physical illness involves abnormalities of bodily structure and function, anatomy and physiology, so mental illness involves abnormalities of mental structure and function, abnormalities of cognition, emotion, and motivation that result in abnormal, deviant behavior. It turns out, though, not to be so easy to define abnormal mind and behavior in the abstract. One way to begin is to try to figure out what we mean by normal mind and behavior. And when we ask people, not just psychologists and psychiatrists, but ordinary people on the street, they generally tell us that normal mental and behavioral functioning is characterized by a particular set of features. The first of these is accurate and efficient cognition and other aspects of mental function. Normal people generally see the world the way it really is. They remember things the way they actually happened. They think clearly and communicate comprehensively. Beyond cognition, they tend to have feelings and desires that are appropriate to the situation, and they behave accordingly. Normal people are also generally aware of their thoughts, feelings, and desires, and of their behavior and its impact on other people. They are generally able to control their impulses and emotions, and are able to delay gratification. People generally think reasonably well of themselves. They have relatively high self-esteem. They generally treat others with respect, not like mere objects, and they develop social relations based on affection. And they are generally productive in work and play and in their family lives. And while most of us probably can't become great artists, we are nevertheless able to create things on our own. Taken together, these six features constitute a kind of prototype for normal mental function and normal behavior. But having identified a sort of prototype for normality, how do we characterize deviance? In fact, deviations from normality can be defined in various ways. Perhaps the easiest is deviance from statistical norms. By statistical convention, a score is abnormal if it lies more than two standard deviations above or below the population mean. This frequency criterion is certainly objective, but it has some problems attached to it, not least of which is the problem of estimating population means for all the various mental characteristics on which people might deviate. But that's a practical problem. In principle, we can define deviance in statistical terms, but there's also the problem of what to do about positive deviations. An IQ less than 70 is more than two standard deviations away from the mean IQ of 100. And if other factors are also present, that can lead an individual to be classified with a form of mental illness known as mental retardation. An IQ greater than 130, more than two standard deviations above the mean, can lead an individual to be classified as a genius. But while we consider mental retardation to be a form of mental illness, we usually don't think of genius that way. A further problem is that even negative deviations are not necessarily signs of mental abnormality or mental illness. For example, a person who is more than two standard deviations below the mean on extroversion might merely be shy. Another approach is to define abnormality in terms of deviation from social norms. Every group, every organization, every society imposes certain expectations and demands on its members. And some people simply don't or can't do what they're supposed to do. 
Given that human experience, thought, and action take place in an expressly social context, this compliance criterion may well be useful for evaluating which deviations we should pay attention to. But it also has its problems. For example, norms vary across societies. In the former Soviet Union, political dissidents were sometimes classified as mentally ill and confined to mental hospitals simply for disagreeing with their government. And the same thing sometimes happens in China today. Moreover, norms even vary across epochs within society. When I began my graduate studies in 1970, homosexuality was listed as a mental illness in the official Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Then, around 1973, the American Psychiatric Association took a vote and decided that it wouldn't consider homosexuality to be a mental illness any longer. One may agree with that vote, as I do, but the essentially political process by which the status of homosexuality was changed should give us pause. If we're looking for an objective standard by which to evaluate deviance, we really want one that's constant across groups. The length of a foot or a yard doesn't vary from Denmark to Ghana, nor does the diagnosis of cancer. Why should the criteria for mental illness be any different? Yet a third approach to identifying deviations from normality is a criterion of personal distress. Mental illness is usually manifested in symptoms that create problems for the patient and cause considerable concern to the patient, him or herself. This subjective cr criterion for mental illness may be important in leading a patient to seek the help of a professional, but it too has some problems. In the first place, people's self-perceptions are not always accurate. Some people believe they're ill when they're not. But more important in the present context, some mentally ill people do not appreciate that they're mentally ill and resist diagnosis and treatment. This is a particular problem in schizophrenia and in a category of mental illness known as the personality disorders. In general, we can distinguish between two kinds of symptoms of mental illness, ego syntonic and ego dystonic. Ego dystonic symptoms are perceived by the patient, him or herself, as abnormal, unusual, and unwanted. They're the kinds of symptoms that lead people to seek help for themselves. But ego syntonic symptoms are not perceived that way at all. They may bother other people and lead other people to wish that the patient would seek help. But from the point of view of the patient, him or herself, they're not an issue. They're not a problem. They're just the way he or she is, the way things are. Even when people's self-perceptions are accurate, though, we would not want to substitute self-diagnosis for objective assessment by a trained professional. We don't let patients self-diagnose cancer and heart disease. Why would we allow them to self-diagnose depression and anxiety disorder? The fourth criterion we can use to identify deviations from normal mental functioning is a criterion of maladaptiveness. Mental illness often leads people to engage in behaviors that are harmful to themselves and others. For example, people with depression may be at elevated risk for suicide. People with antisocial personality disorder, by definition, engage in antisocial behaviors. Normal mental function is almost by definition adaptive because the purpose of the mind is to aid the organism's adaptation to its environment. So a harmfulness criterion is helpful in diagnosing mental illness. On the other hand, not all maladaptive behavior is a sign of mental illness. Criminal behavior is maladaptive, harmful to the people against whom the crime is perpetrated, and harmful to the criminal when he or she is caught and punished. But we do not label all criminal behavior as a product of mental illness. If we did, we wouldn't punish it. In fact, the insanity defense is attempted in a very small minority of criminal cases, and it is successful in only a minority of these attempts. If maladaptiveness were the sole criterion for mental illness, we wouldn't have any prisons, but we'd have a lot of mental hospitals. <laughs>
So each of these definitions has certain assets and liabilities. None of them by itself is sufficient for a diagnosis of mental illness. And for that matter, it may be the case that none of them is necessary either. But taken together, these two lists of features, characteristic of normality and deviance, constitute a kind of prototype of the typical case of mental illness. Not every mentally ill person will lack all the criteria of normality or display all the criteria of deviance. But most mentally ill people will display some or most of them so that the mentally ill are related to each other by a principle of family resemblance. In actual practice, Mental illnesses are not diagnosed by abstract conceptual definitions of mental abnormality and deviance, but rather in terms of various syndromes characterized by particular symptoms and signs. I identify nine major categories of mental illness. And I want to say at the outset that this particular grouping differs from such official classifications as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. And the grouping also differs a little bit from what's in your textbook, which in turn is based on the DSM. For a variety of reasons, this grouping works better for me. There's also a tenth category of mental illness, what are sometimes called problems in living, which are not really mental illnesses. But I include them in this class because they are often treated by psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers, and other mental health professionals. First, there are the organic brain syndromes, in which there are gross impairments in mental function that result from known insult, injury, or disease in the brain or some other portion of the central nervous system. Alzheimer's disease is a clear example here. The patient suffers memory loss and other aspects of dementia resulting from plaques and tangles in cortical tissue. Other examples are the amnesic syndrome, such as suffered by patient HM, associated with damage to the hippocampus and related areas, and the various forms of aphasia associated with damage to Broca's or Wernicke's areas. In the organic brain syndromes, the development of various mental functions in the individual proceeds normally until something occurs that causes some insult, injury, or disease affecting brain tissue. But in the developmental disorders, there is an abnormal pace of development affecting one or more mental functions pretty much from birth. The classic example is mental retardation, in which the individual shows subnormal levels of mental function, as indicated by an IQ score less than 70, in degrees ranging from mild to profound, accompanied by an inability to meet the demands of his or her environment. Another example is autism, a disorder characterized by a severe inability to relate to and communicate with other people. In classic autism, the individual has very little by way of language function. In Asperger's syndrome, the person is able to function more normally in terms of language and communication. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, a relatively new syndrome is typically diagnosed in children. Originally, it was thought that children would outgrow ADHD with time, but in fact, many children with ADHD grow up to be adults with ADHD, and the syndrome is now diagnosed and treated in adults as well as children. Next on our list are the psychoses, in which the patient experiences gross impairments in reality testing and other aspects of cognitive function. The term psychosis is actually not used anymore as a technical term in psychiatry and clinical psychology, though you'll still hear it quite a bit, which is why I'm introducing it here. The psychoses are often labeled as functional, meaning that they have no known organic cause. However, these disorders are almost certainly organic in nature. As their underlying brain pathology becomes known, they may well be shifted to the category of the organic brain syndromes. Perhaps the most well-known of the psychotic disorders is schizophrenia, which is characterized by disordered language and thought processes. There's also a variety of affective disorders, which primarily affect emotional functioning, 
affect as opposed to cognition, as the name implies. This includes bipolar disorder, also known as manic depressive illness, and varieties of unipolar affective disorder, including pure mania, which is relatively rare, and unipolar depression, which is more common. We'll talk more about the neural substrates, especially the biochemical substrates, of schizophrenia and affective disorder later in these lectures. In contrast to the psychoses, the neuroses are a set of syndromes that share primary symptoms of anxiety in common. Like psychosis, neurosis is no longer a technical term in psychiatry and clinical psychology, but you'll still hear it quite a bit, and the term lives on in neuroticism, one of the big five personality traits. Again, that's why I'm using it here. The neuroses include a variety of phobic disorders, all of which entail excessive, unwarranted and irrational fears of specific objects and situations, such as snakes and spiders, heights, open spaces, or public places. In contrast, anxiety disorder is characterized by a free-floating state of apprehension and worry, anxiety, but are unattached to any object. While anxiety disorder is pretty pervasive, and the patient anxious pretty much all the time, Panic disorder entails episodes of anxiety that suddenly wash over the person in what are known as panic attacks. Then they subside and the person is okay for a while. Okay, that is, except that the person is worrying about when the next panic attack is coming, but at least that's a specific worry. That worry over a panic attack doesn't classify as a phobia, however, because the panic attacks are very real. And then, finally, we have obsessive-compulsive disorder, which is characterized by recurring, unwanted ruminations about certain events, events in the past or events in the future. These thoughts are obsessions. Obsessions are often accompanied by overt behaviors that are intended to reduce the impact of the obsession or the likelihood that the obsessional event will occur. These are compulsions. The classic case is of a person who is obsessed with the idea that he hasn't turned the gas off on the stove, and so compulsively checks the stove to make sure the burner is off. With the exception of anxiety disorder, most of the neuroses are considered to be functional in nature, in that they are not caused by any physiological abnormality. But in contrast to the psychoses, there's less question that we will eventually find some organic involvement. Rather, phobias and obsessive-compulsive disorder are commonly attributed to the patient's experiential history of social learning. There does appear to be a biochemical substrate to anxiety disorder and panic attacks, though, and we'll talk about this issue later. Next are the psychophysiological disorders, also known sometimes as the psychosomatic disorders. These involve actual damage to some internal organ some tissue, some part of the body, typically a part of the body that's enervated by the autonomic nervous system, and usually associated with psychological stress. You'll remember that the autonomic nervous system mediates the organism's response to stressful events, preparing it for flight or fight, or tend and befriend. The theory is that the psychophysiological disorders reflect the consequences of this prolonged activation of the autonomic nervous system. Perhaps the classic example of a psychophysiological disorder are so-called psychosomatic ulcers. Not all ulcers are psychosomatic in nature, but there are some gastric ulcers that occur in the context of high levels of psychological stress. And because they're presumably caused by the stress in some way, they're labeled as psychosomatic. Another psychosomatic disorder commonly encountered is coronary heart disease, which sometimes seems to be closely related to the patient's personality and patterns of behavior. There's a behavior called type A behavior, marked by high levels of competitiveness, ambition, and obsession, and getting things done quickly, not taking time to reflect on what you're doing, strong needs for control in various kinds of situations. 
people with so-called type A personality actually put themselves under a great deal of stress, a lot more stress than they'd experience otherwise. And again, this prolonged self-exposure to stress seems to put the cardiovascular system under a great deal of pressure. If somebody says, you're going to give yourself a heart attack, there might be some truth to that. Note that this is another example of the reciprocal interaction between the person, behavior, and the environment. Type A people engage in behaviors that create more stressful environments for themselves, and this more stressful environment increases their susceptibility to heart disease. There are other instances of anatomical damage or physiological malfunction that may be stress-related. For example, stress can lead to a breakout of acne, pimples, or a temporary disruption of the menstrual cycle in women. Acne is not always psychosomatic in nature, any more than ulcers are, nor is heart disease. But when these problems occur in the context of stress, and appear to be caused by stress, then we have a psychophysiological disorder where the person's psychological condition affects his physiology. Psychosomatic disorders occur where something about the mind affects the body. Next are the dissociative disorders, very rare but very, very interesting theoretically, in which there is a disruption of conscious awareness and or conscious control. Dissociative disorders come in two broad types, those that affect memory function and those that affect sensation, perception, or voluntary action. In dissociative amnesia, which is also sometimes known as functional amnesia or psychogenic amnesia, the patient experiences a loss of memory for a certain period of time, a loss of autobiographical memory. But this amnesia occurs in the absence of any demonstrable brain insult, injury, or disease. It's a functional amnesia in that sense. In fugue, also known as psychogenic fugue, and sometimes as dissociative fugue, there's an amnesia, but the patient also loses his or her identity, forgets who he or she is. The patient may even take up another identity and sometimes moves to a new location. Hence the name fugue for flight. In multiple personality disorder, sometimes known as dissociative identity disorder, it appears as if two or more different personalities, two or more different identities, inhabit the same body, and there's a shifting back and forth among them. The classic case of the three faces of Eve is a very good example. In all these disorders, the basic problem is one of conscious awareness. The memories are still there. The identity is still there, available in storage. But the person can't gain conscious access to this information. It's this loss of conscious access that's the hallmark of the dissociative disorders. Dissociation can also extend beyond memory and identity to basic functions of sensation, perception, and action. In functional blindness, the patient can't see, doesn't have the conscious experience of seeing, although the visual system, from a strictly physiological point of view, is completely intact. Same thing goes with functional deafness. The person doesn't have the conscious experience of hearing, but the auditory system is intact. Or functional tactile anesthesia, where the person loses the sensation of touch. There is also functional paralysis, where the person loses the ability to move an arm, or a leg, or talk, or sometimes experiences a total paralysis. But again, there's nothing wrong with the skeletal musculature, and there's nothing wrong with the peripheral nervous system. These syndromes, where the dissociation affects sensation, perception, or action, used to be labeled hysteria, but that term is no longer used in technical discourse in psychiatry and mental health. They are now usually called the conversion disorders, for reasons we don't have to go into. But they're really dissociative disorders because they involve a disruption of conscious awareness, conscious sensation and perception, and conscious action, as opposed to conscious memory and identity, but a disruption of consciousness all the same.
Somewhat related are the somatoform disorders, in which the patient has a number of physical complaints, but no organic cause can be found to account for them. Probably the most familiar form of somatoform disorder is hypochondriasis, where the person doesn't actually complain about various physical problems, but is excessively worried about physical illness. Then there's somatization disorder, in which the person has multiple somatic complaints, multiple physical complaints, usually spread out over a number of bodily systems, cardiovascular, skeletal, whatever. But a physical exam shows that there's nothing actually wrong. Somatization disorder is sometimes known as Briquet's syndrome, after the psychiatrist who first described it. And it's also sometimes called hysteria, which just confuses things, because hysteria was also used as a label for the conversion disorders that we just discussed. Another reason why the term hysteria is no longer used in the discourse on mental health. In somatoform pain disorder, the patient's complaints are always about pain. Pain in the foot, pain in the wrist, pain in the jaw, pain in the head, wherever. Again, this is a psychological disorder because no organic cause can be found that will account for these kinds of complaints. And finally, there's body dysmorphic disorder, where the person perceives some part of his or her body as abnormal or wrong somehow. The nose is too long, the lips are too thick, the earlobes are too thick, whatever. Viewed objectively, though, nobody else can see anything wrong with the body part in question. These people tend to consult cosmetic surgeons with some frequency, and some cosmetic surgeons are only too happy to collect payments to correct something that doesn't need correction in the first place. The personality disorders consist of deeply ingrained patterns of maladaptive behavior, which typically begin to develop in adolescence, sometimes even childhood. In order to understand the personality disorders a little bit better, recall the distinction between egodystonic and egosyntonic symptoms. Egodystonic symptoms are experienced as alien, as unwanted, not right, by the patient him or herself. The symptoms of the psychoses and neuroses are egodystonic in that sense, because the person with schizophrenia is disturbed by the hallucinations. The person with depression is disturbed by the fact that he or she is depressed. The obsessive compulsive wants to get rid of her obsession and compulsion. By contrast, the symptoms of the personality disorders are egosyntonic. They're experienced by the patient as part of his or her normal personality. These symptoms don't bother the patient at all, but they certainly bother other people. In antisocial personality disorder, the person engages in a pervasive pattern of incorrigible antisocial behavior. People with this syndrome seem to be incapable of conforming their behavior to social demands. Antisocial personality disorder is also sometimes known as psychopathic personality disorder, psychopathy, or sociopathy. But in any case, the pattern of incorrigible antisocial behavior is egosyntonic. The person with antisocial personality disorder doesn't think there's anything wrong. He's just the way he is. It's everybody else who sees that there's a problem. Similarly, in borderline personality disorder, a person experiences a blurring of the boundaries between self and others. Lots of difficulty managing affect. A person's given to outbursts of strong affect. But the person, him or herself, sees this as his or her normal personality. It's other people who are bothered by this pattern of behavior. In the personality disorders, the dysfunctional behavior is pervasive. It seems to affect the person's entire personality. In contrast, the category of mental illness known as the behavioral disorders consists of specific maladaptive behaviors, discrete behavioral problems that cause the person a lot of distress, a lot of trouble, and may well cause a lot of distress to people around him or her, too. But there are no other signs of mental illness. Alcoholism and alcohol abuse is a widely recognized form of behavioral disorder because there's a specific behavior. The person drinks too much, drinks to excess, can't control drinking, 
Drug addiction and other forms of substance abuse are also classified under this label, as are addictions to other kinds of things, sex, gambling, other activities. These are also recognized as behavioral disorders. In addition to these widely recognized forms of mental illness, there are also more mundane problems in living, a term coined by Thomas Schasch, a psychiatrist who's actually a famous critic of psychiatry, in a book he wrote in the early 1960s called The Myth of Mental Illness. Josh famously argued that syndromes like schizophrenia and affective disorder are not mental illnesses at all, but simply problems in living. We don't have to go that far, though, to recognize that people in ordinary life sometimes have difficulties that lead them to seek counseling from a mental health professional, even though they're not mentally ill. People in a stressful marriage may seek marriage counseling. People with various forms of sexual dysfunction may seek treatment for that. Adolescents and adults who have just moved from one situation to another may have problems making the adjustment. There may be stress reactions, the stress of losing your job or the stress of losing your marriage, and you need some help getting through it. Sometimes just vocational quandaries. Do I want to be a dentist or do I want to be an opera singer? Sometimes these problems can be resolved by people working by themselves. When that's not enough, they consult mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, marriage and family counselors. There's no implication that these people are mentally ill in the sense that people with schizophrenia or depression or anxiety disorder are mentally ill, but they do need help and certain mental health professionals are equipped to provide that service. Mental illness is analogous to physical illness. Physical illness, heart disease, lung cancer, whatever, entails abnormalities in anatomy or physiology. You've got a broken bone, you've got a tumor, you've got a heart murmur, you've got high blood pressure, you've got whatever it is you've got. And similarly, in mental illness, we're talking about abnormalities in mental structure or function. In Alzheimer's disease and most other forms of dementia, and in schizophrenia, we see abnormalities in cognition. The person has difficulties in thinking or remembering or communicating or hallucinates, which is a problem of perception. In the anxiety disorders and in the affective disorders, the abnormality is in the emotional domain. These individuals have emotional experiences that are inappropriate to the situation. And in psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder, we see abnormalities in the motivational domain. These individuals can't conform their behavior to what other people want them to do and don't respond effectively to the usual sorts of rewards and punishments. In any case, these abnormalities in cognition, emotion, and motivation result in abnormalities in behavior, the kind of abnormal, maladaptive behavior that brings people to the attention of mental health professionals to begin with. Pursuing the analogy further, you'll notice that the language of medicine pervades our discussion of psychopathology, of mental illness. Thus, we speak of mental patients with mental illnesses that are associated with a particular etiology or origins, course, and a prognosis. These mental illnesses are treated in mental hospitals, which also have rehabilitation for the chronically mentally ill and programs of mental hygiene to prevent mental illness from occurring in the first place. Mental illness is diagnosed by symptoms or publicly observable manifestations of psychopathology, and also by signs, manifestations of psychopathology that are identifiable by a trained professional. These symptoms and signs can be grouped into syndromes or clusters of symptoms and signs that tend to occur together and diseases, which are syndromes whose underlying causes or underlying pathology is known. These analogies and the fact that the language of mental illness shows such striking parallels with the language of physical disease are part of what's known as the medical model of psychopathology. I want to talk about the medical model of psychopathology a little bit more 
because there's often considerable misunderstanding about what exactly the medical model says about mental illness. It's commonly believed, and it's often presented this way in textbooks, that the medical model ascribes mental illness to organic causes. That is, that every psychiatric syndrome is ultimately some kind of organic brain syndrome. As one enthusiast once put it, behind every twisted thought there lies a twisted molecule. In fact, this somatogenic view of mental illness is quite popular, but it's not really what the medical model is all about. All the medical model asserts is that mental illness has natural causes. Natural causes as opposed to what? Well, to begin with, supernatural causes. What's known as the supernatural model ascribes mental illness to supernatural causes such as possession by the devil and other spirits. This was a very common view of mental illness in medieval Europe and resulted in such treatments as exorcism and was bound up with things like burning witches at the stake. The Malleus Maleficarum, published in the late 15th century, was a manual used by witch hunters to identify people who were witches. But when you look at the book, you notice that many of the signs by which witches were identified we now recognize as the symptoms of mental illness. We no longer explain those signs as the work of the devil, the way the supernatural model does. Instead, we see these symptoms as the products of natural causes. That's the medical model. To take another contrast, the moral model holds that mental illnesses represent willful behavior that is under the voluntary control of the individual. This view essentially treats mental illness as if it were criminal behavior, with things like incarceration and punishment prescribed as treatments instead of therapy and rehabilitation. This was a very common view of mental illness in pre-Enlightenment Europe up until the time that Philippe Penel, a French physician who lived around the time of the French Revolution, freed the insane from their chains. Before that, mentally ill individuals were locked up, imprisoned, treated like common criminals. And again, as opposed to the moral model, the medical model does not hold mental patients responsible for their illnesses. Schizophrenia, anxiety disorder, they just happen to you the way any other illness happens to you, as a product of natural causes that can be understood through the scientific method. The diagnosis of mental illness is essentially an act of categorization, in which patients or their illnesses are assigned to categories based on the same sort of process that we use when we categorize other objects. In psychiatric diagnosis, or for that matter, any form of medical diagnosis, the patient's symptoms and signs serve as features. And what the clinician does is to compare the patient's symptoms and signs to those that are associated with various diagnostic categories. These days, we look at the diagnostic categories listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders published by the American Psychiatric Association. The DSM, as it's known, is the official list of mental illnesses recognized by the psychiatric profession in North America and has been adopted by other helping professions such as clinical psychology and clinical social work as well. Again, the patient's illness is diagnosed in terms of that illness in the DSM which most closely fits his or her pattern of symptoms. We classify people into the various categories of mental illness in exactly the same way that other physicians will diagnose a form of cancer or heart disease or whatever. It's exactly the same process. And frankly, it's exactly the same process we use to classify objects such as triangles versus squares or fish as opposed to birds. While physicians have been diagnosing physical illness for a long time, as long as there have been physicians, the diagnosis of mental illness is of relatively recent origin. Well into the Enlightenment, our conceptions of mental illness were dominated by, first, the supernatural model, and then the moral model. It was only in the early 19th century 
that Jean-Étienne Dominique Esquirol, another French physician, in fact, a protege of Philippe Pinel, made a formal distinction between the insane, the mentally ill, the mentally deficient, mentally retarded, and criminals. In the latter part of the 19th century, Emil Kraepelin, a Swiss psychiatrist, further distinguished between two different forms of psychosis, what he called dementia praecox, which we now recognize as schizophrenia, and manic depressive illness, basically the major affective disorders. And a little bit later in the 19th century, Pierre Janet, a French psychiatrist, did the same thing for the neuroses, distinguishing between hysteria and psychasthenia. Hysteria essentially being the dissociative, conversion, and somatoform disorders, as I described them earlier, and psychasthenia being the rest of the neuroses, where anxiety and depression dominate. The categories of mental illness have grown considerably since the latter part of the 19th century. The first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, published in 1952, contained only about 100 diagnostic categories. The fourth edition, published in 1994, contained almost 300 categories. The latest edition, the fifth edition of the DSM, released in 2013, has almost 400. Before the publication of the third edition of the DSM in 1980, the various categories of psychiatric diagnosis were generally considered as proper sets. Each syndrome was associated with a particular list of signs and symptoms that were singly necessary and jointly sufficient to define the illness. So, for example, when Eugen Bleuler renamed dementia praecox as schizophrenia, a term still in use today, he argued that all schizophrenics shared four symptoms in common that came to be known as the four A's. Associative disturbance, a certain disorganization in the logical organization of thought and communication. Anhedonia, an inability to experience positive emotions. Ambivalence, a lack of initiative. And autism, a withdrawal from others and a general detachment from reality. All schizophrenics were thought to show these four signs. And if you showed these four signs, you were a schizophrenic. Bleuler further distinguished four subtypes of schizophrenia by adding defining features, defining symptoms. In simple schizophrenia, you simply had the four A's. In hebephrenic schizophrenia, you added a feature of childlike demeanor. In catatonic schizophrenia, you added a feature of motor immobility. In paranoid schizophrenia, the patient showed delusions. The result was a nested hierarchy, just like the ones we're familiar with from the lecture on categorization. There were two major forms of mental illness, psychosis and neurosis. Two major forms of psychosis, manic depressive illness and schizophrenia, and four forms of schizophrenia, simple, hebephrenic, catatonic, and paranoid. Each subcategory was created by adding one or more defining features, thus forming a nested hierarchy. Within a particular level, there were sharp boundaries between adjacent categories. You were either psychotic or neurotic. You had manic depressive illness or schizophrenia. You were a simple schizophrenic or a catatonic schizophrenic. The view of the diagnostic categories as proper sets organized by symptoms that were singly necessary and jointly sufficient to define each diagnosis was extremely popular and very satisfying until people began to actually work with it. This traditional view then quickly encountered problems of the sort that are familiar from our earlier critique of the classical view of categories as proper sets. The simple fact was that very few patients actually resembled the textbook descriptions of various syndromes. First, there was a problem of partial expression. Many patients displayed some, but not all, of the symptoms that defined a particular syndrome. In the case of schizophrenia, this led to the introduction of new syndromes, such as schizoid personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, and paranoid personality disorder. <laughs> 
the same thing happened with depression. And there was also a problem of combined expression. Many patients displayed the defining symptoms of many different categories. In the case of schizophrenia, again, this led to the introduction of new syndromes, such as pseudoneurotic schizophrenia, where there was a lot of anxiety, pseudo-psychopathic schizophrenia, where there was a lot of antisocial behavior, and schizoaffective disorder, where the patient combined some symptoms of schizophrenia with some features of manic depressive illness. And the term borderline personality disorder was introduced to cover patients who displayed the symptoms of both psychosis and neurosis. They were literally on the border between these major diagnostic categories. Accordingly, for the third edition of DSM, published in 1980, the diagnostic system was reformed to construe the psychiatric categories as fuzzy sets, not as proper sets. Under this revisionist view, there was no clear boundary that distinguished schizophrenia or anxiety disorder from other forms of mental illness. Symptoms were considered to be characteristic rather than defining features. They were only probabilistically associated with various syndromes. Delusions may be highly likely to occur in schizophrenia, but they do not define schizophrenia because they are also observed in other syndromes and not all schizophrenics are delusional. Moreover, specific instances of the categories will share a family resemblance, resulting in a great deal of heterogeneity among patients who carry the same diagnosis. Each syndrome may be represented by a kind of prototypical patient who has many, but not necessarily all, of the symptoms that are characteristic of a particular category. This system was continued in the fourth edition of DSM, published in 1994, and the fifth edition, published in 2013. So, for example, schizophrenia is diagnosed when the patient presents any two characteristic symptoms, so long as at least one is a positive symptom. Positive symptoms entail the presence of something that's normally absent, like hallucinations or delusions. Negative symptoms entail the absence of something that is normally present, such as appropriate emotional responses. These symptoms must have been active for at least six months, and they must cause dysfunction in either the social or occupational spheres of living. What this means is that one patient with schizophrenia may have delusions and hallucinations, while another may have disorganized speech and flat affect, but both have schizophrenia. The modern diagnosis of schizophrenia also abandons the Bloilerian subtypes, such as hypophrenic and catatonic schizophrenia, in favor of a simpler distinction between type 1 schizophrenia, where positive symptoms dominate, and type 2 schizophrenia, dominated by negative symptoms. This same idea of the psychiatric diagnoses as fuzzy sets is applied throughout the DSM. So, for example, in order to receive a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, the patient has to show at least five of nine characteristic symptoms over a period of two weeks. Any five will do. None is necessary. And a total of five is sufficient. Note that you don't even have to be depressed to get a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Diminished interest in things, coupled with weight loss, insomnia, loss of energy, and inability to concentrate, that will do the trick too. So, regardless of diagnostic category, there's no longer any expectation that all of the symptoms listed as characteristic of a syndrome will be present in any particular case. What this means is that diagnosis is very much a matter of judgment under uncertainty. There's no longer any algorithm no longer any list of singly necessary and jointly sufficient defining symptoms that will allow the professional to solve the problem of assigning the correct diagnosis. How many of the patient's symptoms are highly characteristic of schizophrenia? And how many are more characteristic of other diagnostic categories? In this symptom, textbook cases serve more as category prototypes than lists of defining features 
and there is an explicit recognition of the heterogeneity among actual patients, all carrying a particular diagnosis. Currently, psychiatric diagnosis is based on symptoms reported by the patients or observed by others. But these days, that's not how medical diagnoses are made. Medical diagnosis may begin with symptoms, but it ends with laboratory tests that reveal underlying pathologies of anatomy and physiology. During her monthly self-examination, a woman may feel a lump in her breast, but that's not enough for a diagnosis of cancer. First, she goes in for a mammogram to confirm the presence of a mass, and then maybe a biopsy to see whether it's benign or malignant. And later, mammograms and biopsies are repeated to evaluate the success of the treatment. In the future, psychiatric diagnosis is headed in this direction. Some theorists would like to make psychiatric diagnoses in terms of underlying pathologies of nervous system structure and function, much the way neurological diagnoses are done now. Another direction would be to base diagnoses on laboratory tests of mental structure and function. What those tests might look like is the subject of the next lecture.